So a very warm welcome to this year's pre-conference workshop at OER by Domains 21. We are so excited to welcome a wonderful team of presenters, Leo, Vera and Fabio, to share a tale of two OEPs. And if you're in the audience live with us today, then please find your clap emoji now, because I'd like to invite you to give a very warm, if virtual, welcome to our presenters as they kick off this pre-conference workshop. I hope you're in the mood to ask lots of questions and engage and get this hour-long session underway with a warm clap around the audience. So, Leo and Herrera, a warm welcome and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks everyone for, um, for joining us um, for a tale of two OEPs. Um, today, this, uh, our focus is on looking at open educational practices from a policy viewpoint. And um, so we, we tend to talk quite a bit about policy in the open education community. Um, and, um, and today we're going to go a bit deeper into, well, what, what really is that? What's that all about? What use might that be to us? And, um, and the idea is also very much to get your views and kind of have a, um, a, a very interactive kind of session. Um, so, um, so let's, uh, let's get underway. I know I can. Um, so yeah, just talk for a long time about this because there's because I could go on about it forever, and we don't want that. But um, but we uh, we know that in the um, the open education movement um, historically, it's been quite focused on the um, open educational resources OER specifically, and um, Meanwhile, in the open education, I guess, scholarly literature um, in the last few years, there's been, um, I would say, a, um, a significant turn towards a discussion of a, a kind of a concept of OEP, of open educational practices. And, um, and to me, that's really interesting because um, the, the, the initial introduction of open educational practices as a term seemed to um, be quite focused on um, on the idea that um, you don't just have OER that just kind of magically come into existence and then people learn with them, but actually all of these processes of making them, of adapting them, of learning from them, um, of um, you, you know, all the, the practices around um, educational resources, open or otherwise, are actually practices that are undertaken by people. And so, um, so that was um, already, I think that was a, a um, an important kind of um, insight. And then there was a kind of a next level of, um, of kind of OEP literature that was saying, well, actually, um, you could have practices that are open that are not actually really all that much about open educational resources as well. Um, and, um, and, and this is kind of where you get into the territory of like, well, what does it mean anyway to say that something is open and a resource can be open because we're talking about having a, an, an open license, maybe um, open access to it. Um, but um, an open practice um, implies maybe something could be open in all kinds of um, different senses and the boundaries of what are open practices versus what are closed practices suddenly become a much murkier kind of um, terrain that that's it's quite hard to um, to, to figure out where, where that boundary lies. Um, and so for this reason, I think because um, because open educational practices are still a bit of an emerging um, discussion, um, then they have not tended, I think, to be the focus of policies very much. Um, our, um, so uh, one of the things that, that we've been doing over the last, um, I guess, year and a half, two years, um, Javier and I and Fabio as well, have been, we've been working um, a bit with the OER World Map Project. Um, and one of the things that we've done there has been to produce a kind of a, um, a kind of child um, site of the world map, which is called the OE Policy Hub. And that's where, where um, we're looking at the collection of data 
um, that that the map already had and the further data that we've been able to gather since we've been working with it, which has been a sort of significant increase on the kinds of policies that are out there. Um, and so we also like to share a bit of that, um, that info with you today. And we'll come on to that in a bit. Um, but so first of all, um, what we would like to do is uh, have a look at um, some of your thoughts via the excited of meter. The mentee um, as well, if we can put the link in the chat. I'm on eat, don't worry. <laughs> um, and the link, thank you. Um, so that is the direct link, it's in the chat. Um, it should take you to the same place, but otherwise, otherwise um, you can also just go on menti.com and put in 26331717. And I'm just going to come out of my slides and over to. I've been practicing yeah. this. I've sorry. Um, can I just double check on the sound? Like um, driving this thing. Leo, I think you're slightly dropping in and out. Um, can I just yes. double check that everybody can hear Leo? Okay. Maybe you yes, can I'm give us a thumbs up. Um, it's sort of we can hear you, but it's um slightly dropping uh, out in that. and out. Sorry about that. I, I do seem to have some kind of um, sort of bad, slightly bad connection going on, but I'll do my best to remain connected. <laughs> no worries, Leo. We can hear you, and I'm sure um, so we are, will be able to come and join in as well um, as needed. Yeah, in case of emergency. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. Um, well, so, uh, thank you all for um, your uh, responses. Love to see we've got lovely to see we've got people from um, a range of different places here, and I, and I think that that means also a range of different perspectives on these issues, which is um, which is always good. So I'm just going to move on. Um, and this isn't this is not a test. This is just a really like a fun kind of quiz in a way. I hope. Um, which world region do you think has the most um, open education policies? Somebody's getting in front with North America straight away. Europe, Europe. Oh, Europe is gaining. Europe is strong. Vote. Just give it a try. Oh, oh, just, it doesn't. It doesn't. It really. You know. It's just. Uh, just to see what. What. What people think. Um, and um, okay, we're staying. We're staying pretty two tone on this question. So uh, I'll move. I'll move. Uh, move on. Here's actually what we have found in our uh, research based on the um, policies collected by the OER World Map. Um, and um, visible through the policy hub is that North America is definitely the leading kind of home of, uh, of open education policies. Um, Europe is pretty close behind and as we can see other world regions, as far as we can tell and we, we, we have tried to find out, um, so there, there, there may well be some more policies um, lurking these other regions of the world but um, this isn't def you know for sure the absolutely definitive data set but this is based on what um our, our current best estimate really of the of the data so i think that's quite that's quite interesting because obviously um in uh, asia for example we're talking about a humongous 
region in terms of population, in terms of uh, institutions and countries, and um, so surprisingly small there. Anyway, we uh, so that um, I think is quite uh, interesting, but we're not that surprising to see North America kind of in in the lead. Um, in terms of the policy scope, um, so this is the kind of a um, what we mean by this is what is the policy really? Uh, what what's the nature of the policy? Um, so one type, um, one one scope here is a dedicated open education or OER policy, um, which is what we quite often um, tend to imagine when we're talking about open education policy. But there could well be these other kinds of policies, educational policy with some kind of open education component. Similarly, ICT or labor market policies have an open education component or more of a general openness policy with educational component. Um, do feel free to vote. Um, do you think might be most important? Yeah, it's, it's just for you to, to guess around how the landscape looks. So even yeah. if you don't know anything, just give it a try. Um, there's a drop down menu in the Mentimeter. So. It's. Oh, lovely. Are you not getting the drop down? If you click on the words, Teresa, if you, uh, it will come up in uh, as I was showing the next slide. Sorry. Uh, um, I'm sorry if it's hard to read. That's uh, um, not helpful. Sorry about that. Okay, so. In terms of the policy scope, um, in terms of policies that we have collected, dedicated um, open education policy is definitely the biggest group, um, looks like over half of the total, um, with the remainder taken up with um, the other types of scope. The educational policy with open education component is also pretty popular. Um, another thing that we thought would be maybe of interest to you is um, that we've taken a look at what are the kind of key policy elements um, by the different world region. So in North America, it's OER, but even specific, more specifically um, than OER, it's mostly about open textbooks. Um, and, um, and then across the rest of the world, um, we are also seeing OER as really the key policy, um, the, the thing the policy is really mostly focused around. Um, the exception here is in South America, where there is a bit more, um, a bit more of a focus on OEP jointly with OER, which is quite interesting. Um, but so this, this is kind of, I guess, not. Um, uh, it, it, it's, I don't know, to, to me, it wasn't a huge surprise, especially in terms of the open textbook focus in North America. Yeah, uh, it, the comment from Jim is quite <laughs> it's amazing, like, has to, to come to terms with his <laughs> textbook fetish. Well, we, we understand, but it also, it's kind of, it's quite easy, the, the, the way that they have a template, and they will tend to replicate their, their policy, um, which is quite different from, from Europe. In Europe, like, every you basically cannot do policies through templates. It, it's quite weird, but we, we can have a talk about it later. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point, actually. There is a bit of a policy, um, uh, yeah, um, you know, kind of sharing the existing policy and, and, and uh, re reusing it is quite, I think, quite popular. So, here, what I'm curious about is um, how popular um, are these open educational practices in your organization? Um, so just thinking about where you work, um, even if that's Reclaim Hosting, 
um, <laughs> or, uh, or some kind of university maybe. Um, what, um, how much of this kind of practice do you think is um, Okay, great. Great to see. Sorry, it was a scale of, um, hopefully you could see when you're answering the question that there was a scale of one to five, where five is, there is a lot. Um, yeah, great points um, from Lorna and Teresa about the ebook SOS. I've also been following that whole uh, debate um, and um, tweeting about that myself. And, um, and I think this is, uh, uh, really, um, you know, the, the, the pandemic has been a moment where um, people, I think, have woken up and realised that the current um, kind of somewhat exploitative um, attitude of uh, commercial textbook publishers has not only um, always been bad, but actually has got worse in the situation where we all were kind of desperate, um, they've actually deliberately kind of um, jacked up the prices even further. And, um, and that's, that's been, I think, um, you know, in, uh, obviously it's, it's a bad thing, but it also, I think, has really uh, been a wake up call for the sector, I think, in the UK. Yeah, also, um, okay, great, sorry, just, just noting on the comment also from, from Christina, it's not that we have like a policy on OEP, but there are certain policies that we've been looking at. They have a component of, of open educational practices rather than being focused on, on the R. So this is something that we, we can kind of talk a little bit later on. But it's like not the policy basis on, on, on the OEP, but it has some components of practices noted within the policy, not just focused on the, on the R, just that, that's it. Okay, so it's really uh, interesting in terms of um, the the range of different kinds of uh, practices here that that are that are you know all quite quite popular actually um, in people's organisations. Um, and moving along, What about what kind of policy do we have? What does your organization have? What, um, and um, so in, in this question, I should point out, um, does your organization have policy or support in place for these? Because um, one of the, the um, angles that I'm taking on this question of policy, um, as this is a kind of a um, big area of my, uh, current research is, um, is really that if you put support in place for people to be able to do things, then that actually is a policy, even if it doesn't appear to be written as a, um, as a document. Um, so, so yeah, even if there is n not a, a web page that you can point to to say we have a policy on this, but um, there is some funding, some human time, um, some infrastructure, I'm I'm really sorry about the um, Teresa about the difficulty of answering these questions. I'm not sure why that should be the case, but I'll try and sort it out in the next time I do this. <laughs> Yeah, so I like um, your um, response in the chat, Christine. Um, lots of support for many of these. So I think that that's uh, I think that's the case. Um, that's often the case. So open access to research publications. I'm not surprised really to see that way out in the lead, because. I think that, that that's the, the open um, 
movement that has kind of it, it, it's it's uh, of course there's still debates there's still kind of some more complexity there than um than this blanket statement i'm about to make is going to um really um account for but um but that's kind of the uh, the, the the one argument um in the in the open world as far as um higher education institutions are concerned and i think that's because it's all about um research and institutions and academics in general um can see that they want their research out there they don't want um it to be hard to read it um because that's that this is important for institutional and um and a personal academic career kind of prestige um and um and you know you, you want you even on a on a more um you know it's it's not only about kind of your career success but just you know you do all this research and then why should it be difficult to read it i think that that is um that, that's an argument that a lot of people i think have accepted and there's of course all kinds of mandates around in place around providing various forms of open access now um interesting to see the um oer um list with this kind of second place for having the most um, policy or support. Um, open science practices, including open data, I expected a lot for. Um, but so OER is looking more uh, well, better supported than, um, for example, um, open or unbundled uh, courses. Um, the engaging in open professional development practices, I think, um, that's that's um, one that I'm not surprised that there isn't more support, although it's uh, definitely we need to uh, consider, you know, how that that can be improved. Um, and um, and uh, quite quite dis disappointing, but I'm not that surprised to see um, you're putting recognizing staff for contribution or innovation in open or digital teaching. Um, to see that coming in last. I think that's um, one of the, the areas where um, improving this would, would be, a, um, I think, a big help. Right, we have reached the end of Menti. Yeah, we're going to share the, 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 um, the presentation with you all. And so um, you can also have the, uh, uh, the graphs that we put in there. Um, Thanks, Teresa. I think that's a great point about um, the, the, the influence of the pandemic. Um, and that's actually something that I've been, um, been writing about recently is um, that considering this question of um, wh what's been, wh where is the openness in terms of um, the kind of um, pandemic response um, in higher education? And uh, because for a lot of people, I think they were expecting to see um, or hoping to see a big turn to OER. And I don't think it's happened as quickly as we would, would wish it to. Because I still think that there are the, all the, the barriers to people um, understanding the things that they need to understand about OER and, and, um, and start doing things with it um, are still have have still been there during the pandemic, but people have had even less time to really think all of that stuff through, and they've just been focused on the how do I how do I do stuff online um, that I used to do in a room, and that's that's been such a big um, a, a big focus um staff but yeah this idea of getting um, more support for getting your own cpd through kind of open open cpd i think is a is, it, this is a um a good argument to make so uh so just um going back to this um this slide 
I think that what we could say, despite the fact that we, we have um, identified quite a number of um, policies at different levels and um, from all around the world, is that open education policies are still somewhat thin on the ground. Um, that the policies that do exist tend to be focused mostly on OER and um, and that currently the kind of um, the 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 sort of high level exhortation to do more in this space um, coming from for example from UNESCO with the um, 2019 recommendation on OER um, is still quite OER focused um, and and that that's that's been that has been kind of the the focus of the, of UNESCO's work on this topic um, ever since the kind of um, forum on open courseware um, met in I think in 2002 and came up with the phrase open educational resources and um, and you know so it's it's it, that, that, that's very much the space that they've been focused on. I think that they are addressing a bit more the idea of the practices that surround and support um, the, the, the doing of OER and the use of OER, but it's still um, that the language is, is, is a lot about, about the OER. Um, but what about this, this question then that, that OEP, if we're concerned about that, if, if that we're concerned about the fact that it includes practices um, that relate to OER, but also a wider range of things that are not really OER. Um, for me, that's quite an interesting point because those kind of ideas don't seem to be making their way into policy. And this part is more um, of an open, it's some open questions that we'd, we'd love to hear um, comments by, by microphone or by chat. Um, about whether where do we think we should put um, open educational practices in terms of getting them into policies? Um, should they be should there be institutional policies on this? Should there be um, should we look to incorporate these things, embed these things into our wider policies and strategies around digital learning or general education strategies? Um, and what kind of practices, if we are going to talk about putting practices into policy, which practices? So these are these are um, these are. I'm throwing down the gauntlet to you <laughs> to uh, to um, discuss any of those. Yeah. If, aspects. if anyone wants to speak, just just raise a hand Thanks. or just, just to say me me me. We can hand over the mic. The mic I think. No, one of the things that we've been looking, and actually when we were like um, kind of reviewing the policy registry, that there were, at some point someone came with the brilliant idea to have a template for open educational policies. So, but policy it's it's way more complex, and policy making instead is actually it's a complex process, and it needs to be participatory and it needs to be inclusive otherwise it's just a piece of paper and, and this is a discussion that people kind of simplify the discussion or like oh well but we, we have we have a template we can share the template around well th there is another group and this is something that a part of the work that we did it was Lorna and Catherine Cronin participated last year when we were talking about kind of co-creation of open education now uh, open education policies without the focus on on the R, on the resources. And, and, and this is something that I think it, it needs to be a discussion because while, yeah, while um, the UNESCO still is, is focusing in, 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 to, in kind of promoting OER policies, we can see that the uptake of, the, of such policies, it's quite low in comparison with other policies like open science. And when you see the difference of language between the open science recommendations and the open educational resources policies recommendations from UNESCO, there is a huge disbalance in regard of the practice. So if you read the recommendations from UNESCO about open science, it's all about the practice, 
uh, like transparency and replicating someone's study and sharing the practices and sharing the methodologies and sharing the data, while well, instead, well, in the in 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 the OER recommendations, it's all about the resource, the quality of the resource, the resource. So it's it's why do we have this two separate kind of discussions? And it's still a mystery to me. Um, Teresa, can you, can you open the mic for Teresa? Yeah, thanks. It's it's uh, thanks very much, both of you, for for focusing our attention on on this gap and this issue. I think it's really important. I, th I think the, the turning point in the pandemic came when we started to see open science being taken more seriously because of the benefit, clearly, to everybody involved. We wouldn't have a vaccine had it not been really for open science. And I, and I think we really have to find those sort of wins or translate what we're doing into in those sort of terms when we think about open practice more widely because the science one is quite quick and easy to get when you're in a life-threatening uh, situation but lives are being put at risk in terms of access to education throughout the pandemic but we're not seeing that it's invisible um, somehow we need to make that visible that you know there are young people who can't who don't have devices to access education and learning from home there are many many families who are really struggling with the current pandemic situation um, so i think there's an opportunity there but we need to get that focus on uh, the importance of open practices in education to actually counter those sorts of that huge equality gap that's just getting wider and wider Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And, and and digital poverty, so having this obsession of designing like super with low bandwidth cannot use, for example. So it's, it's, it's kind of looking at things. Uh, Christine, uh, that that's actually I'm taking notes, by the way. So this is this is a very good point, Teresa. But but from the other side, I'm seeing that Christine is struggling to understand which sort of which. OEPs could go into policy, for example. So, uh, Christina, you want to talk to us? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, which is why I asked the question earlier in the chat, like, what would it look like to have open educational practices in a policy? And, and I guess it depends on how one defines OEP, which, of course, is very slippery. Um, I can see that there might be policies around open access, open data, um, open science potentially. I mean, it's, I don't know, sometimes it's hard because what you've got is um, faculty, uh, academic freedom kinds of questions that might come up. I don't know. So the kinds of things I'm thinking about in OEP are perhaps um, involving students more in, you know, whether creating open educational resources or participating in, in helping to develop a course and um, uh, course objectives and that kind of thing and and I guess one thing that comes to mind if you're involving students in let's say creating open educational resources is perhaps some kind of um, guidelines around student privacy um, student uh, agency I don't know if you want to call it ownership of what they create or something like that like maybe that could go into a policy so yeah I guess I'm just struggling a little bit <laughs> I think that's. I think those are really good points, Christina. I I, I think that that um, that we you want to um, sort of. I think I think when when we are talking about policy, we we also um, are are not just really talking about um, things that are, things that are required or that are sort of. It's not it's not exactly just a kind of a, on a level of regulation, but it's also like the sort of it's sort of a declaration of intent for an organization on what kind what kinds of things they believe in and are prepared to support and that can unlock um, kind of unlock some of the institutional resources and money for and um, and so uh, so so I think it's 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 partly about clarifying some of those confusing areas around um, intellectual property that 
sometimes make people go, mm, I don't know how, wh whether I'm even allowed to do this. That that can be a kind of, I think, a, um, a, a problem. But it's also, yeah, as um, Sammy is suggesting, a sort of mission statement for OEP. It, it, could be, it could be that you use it as a declaration of this is kind of what we, what we believe um, uh, open education is all about. And I think in a way policy does that, even if you don't um, intend it that way. Yeah, maybe Lorna can, can just tell the, the group or some experiences that she has had because I think she's the best one to explain how some policies, so, so how some practices can be mapped into policy. Lorna? Yeah, sure, no problem. Can I just check? You can hear me okay? We, we can. Good. Um, so, yeah, so in Edinburgh, we have an OER policy. So it is very much focused on open education resources. However, the policy exists in order to encourage practice. So it's not um, a mandatory policy. It doesn't tell you that you must do anything. It's very much there to encourage open practice. So it's there to encourage both staff and students to use and create open education resources. In terms of students, um, we do actually produce quite a lot of student generated open education resources in the university. And a lot of these are produced um, through coursework. Uh, so quite often, um, students will have coursework assignments, the output of which is an open licensed resource. Um, students continue to own the copyright of any content that they um, create as part of their education, uh, but we encourage them to share them under open license. And we see this in all different kinds of formats. Sometimes it's about students creating dedicated open education resources as part of the coursework. Sometimes it might be about creating Wikipedia entries, for example. So there's a lot of practice there. We don't really talk about open education practice much in the university at the policy level, but it's kind of there implicitly across a lot of our other and services. Uh, so the, sorry, did somebody want to come in there? Uh, I don't know what happened with the presentation. It disappeared. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so what I was just going to finish off by saying was we, we have a whole range of policies, obviously, but a lot of them have within them some concept um, of sharing and openness being a good thing that goes right back to the institution's like mission and uh, mission statement and vision which is about sharing our knowledge and making the world a better place so that's really what underpins everything that goes on within the university so you know we have um, our open data repository we have our open access mandates we have the oer policy um, we also try and share a lot of the um the content that we create for MOOCs and open online course, courses. So really the, the OER policy is there in order to influence practice, but we don't necessarily refer to it as an open practice policy, because I think it is very hard to write practice into policy, but I think you can write policies in such a way that they encourage practice. Yeah, and, 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 and I, I agree with, with, with Lorna, absolutely. And the thing is like you don't kind of describe the practice but you encourage and also where the where the things that we, we can see that the, the, it's the policies are missing it's the rewarding around for example career progression in, in with, with with open with open practices yeah um, normally you get the mandate in which you get punished if you do not put your um publication up into the open access repository so you cannot play with career progression Although this is kind of the only element of like practice that get quite noticeable maps into open policies or policies about openness. If I can just jump in. Okay. Yes, please go. Um, there's one other, um, in terms of like rewarding open practice in terms of the, the creation of open education resources. We do actually have that written in as, um, a, I forget the right terminal, it's like a measure of excellence for career progression for teaching staff. 
so the university's framework for um, for career progression was updated, I think, about about 18 months ago. And as part of that, um, one of the pieces of evidence of excellence was actually creating education resources that could be used out with the university, such as open education resources. So that was actually a really positive step for the university to take, to sort of say, well, if you are actually creating open education resources, um, you can use that as evidence if you're going forward for promotion. Whether anyone has actually used that in a promotion case, I don't know. Of course, we have the pandemic has come in since then, and there's been sort of recruitment and promotion freezes of all kinds. Um, so like I say, I don't know if that's been put into practice, but it is interesting that that is now there in amongst our promotion criteria. Yeah, and, 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 and this is actually quite unique. And I think um, um, Lee and I spent December, because we love to spend December doing random things, reading around 300 policies. So, and, and actually, the, the, of course, one of the best models in the world is, is Edinburgh. Um, and because you touch so many issues around the policy that it's, even though we call it policy, and normally, and we have this kind of discussion, but we have this conversation with Tanis Morgan a few months ago, but what in, 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 in North America, they call it like, like actually a strategy. So it's kind of, either it's a policy or a strategic level, it needs to include things that make people willing to do things in the open landscape. So data, uh, citizen science, open science, sharing methodologies, sharing resources, sharing teaching resources, um, sharing even your recording, recorded lectures, um, but, but then you still have to impact on your career. O otherwise, it's just kind of um, taking advantage of the goodwill of people producing things uh, that won't take you anywhere. Um, Leo, would you like to recap the conversation that is going on in the chat uh, for for the recording of, of, of this of this talk? I think that we have uh, mostly been um, sort of having a chat as a um, commentary on what's been on the, on the audio conversation. So, um, yeah, just sort of some feedback regarding um, what, what Lorna was saying about Edinburgh. I said sharing and openness as a good thing, um, as the as the kind of core to the policy um, statements. Um, was a pretty good example of the kind of mission statement I'm referring to. So not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily need to, um, I think, be something um, that, that necessarily goes hugely um, deeper than that so much as just kind of, I guess, setting out as a stall as an organization on, um, you know, what do we think about these things? And I think linking it to, um, this isn't what I said in the chat, this is now just um, expanding on it, sorry. Um, <laughs> but, you know, linking it really to the question of like, what what are we as, a, as an educational institution? What are we here for? Um, and, you know, maybe it, this isn't, maybe this all isn't as radical as sometimes those of us that advocate these things are um, kind of en end up feeling because this is actually just trying to reconnect our organizations with um, with pre-existing earlier missions that they have, you know, claimed to have been brought into existence for. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it does. And, 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 and we're really happy that we could have this conversation before the conference because we will be kind of looking into during the conference and how, how, how people describe this kind of strategic level of work and how, which practices could be rewarded. So try to kind of map at some point some suggestions. But for example, Christina was mentioning here that in their policy, uh, it comes for tenure, producing an OER. But are they they're telling you which kind of OER? Can you, can you tell us a bit more, Christina? Sure, I'll just jump on. Um, so it's actually uh, for, we have two, well, we have multiple streams of faculty, but two streams of tenure track faculty. Uh, one is focused on research and teaching and the other is educational leadership and teaching, um, which is the stream that I'm in. And uh, it's for the second, it can count as part of educational leadership, which counts for part of tenure. But there is no, um, 
There's no information in the policy about uh, what kind of open educational resource. It's it's just you know creation of uh, educational resources that are contributed openly to a repository or or in some other way. So yeah, it could be a textbook, could be something else. Yeah, it's an it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because it's quite a sort of um, a new kind of area of of practice. Then I guess it's. Um, it, can, it might be hard for people who are evaluating the, like, how significant is this practice or how, you know, I mean, I, I do think that there, there um, I have used earlier in the slides the term innovation, and I always um, kind of feel a slight consternation at using it, even though, but, but it, it, it sort of feels like that something that people will know what I mean, but um, but I do worry that um, that people shouldn't necessarily have to do something that's actually innovative so much as just something that's good and worthwhile and valuable. Um, but it also is a little bit relative to, um, you know, people who might regard something as innovative just because it's a bit new to them. So, um, but yeah, I think, I think we do need these, these kind of policies to be quite flexible, um, not necessarily kind of that, you know, like, if you if you've done a an open textbook, then this is worthy. But if you've done some other kind of um, OEP, then it's a bit less. Yeah, we did. It's, it's could I sorry could yeah, I please. come in on on that because I totally recognise what Leo is saying there, and and I'm thinking I think that the the issue I'm seeing. I mean, I've been in teaching for 35 years open educational practice was not something I had ever heard of sort of 15 years ago but open educational practice was something I'd been doing ever since I'd started in teaching so it's this isn't a, a open practices are not a new thing to teachers teachers generally share and provide tips and give each other ideas and that's how you you become a better teacher you learn a lot and because teaching is very demanding in terms of you know you have limited time and resource um, it's that collaborative practice that is really important and I wonder sometimes whether we get a bit too hung up on the acronym and the label and actually I think as Leah was saying really there we, we're not paying attention to the activity the activity is part of the core of being a teacher and uh, you know I think it, it, what, we, what you're doing by getting it to a policy or a strategic level is recognizing that it's important um, and, and that's that's a difficult thing because of managerialism because actually collaborative practice is not very easy to manage it makes it that uh, you know i can perhaps say this because i've now stepped out of the working arena but it makes it difficult to be selective about who gets promoted and who doesn't if everybody collaborates because you can't clearly see who who's the one that's you know the person that needs to be employed or whatever and i think we should be pushing back against that managerialist tendency and saying this is part of the nature of being an educationalist. This is part of the nature of being a teacher in the same way as, you know, this is part of the nature of being an HEI. And I think that's what's been eroded. Mm. Yeah, that, that very much connects with that, that um, rambling point that I was trying to make about, um, you know, sort of asking our, our organizations to remember what they are supposedly there for. <laughs> Okay, well, this has been um, absolutely um, wonderful to um, discuss all of this with, with all of you. Um, we probably should start uh, bringing it to a close. Leo, um, before that, can you share them that what we leave as a present for, for, for whoever wants to update? Yes, yeah. I am about to move to the next yeah. slide. And did you want to um, just explain a bit about this, Happy? Yep. So in the last few years, actually, I will move this a little bit so it doesn't look so weird. In the last years, Leo and I have been creating quite a lot of uh, toolkits and things <laughs> for doing policy. Um, 
um, just yeah, a few. Just a few <laughs> things. <laughs> so when we we think it's like this is kind of a good time and an opportunity, and, and this is also part of the conversation that we had with uh, Catherine Crony not long ago, to review the existing uh, the existing uh, policies or strategies in, at institutional level, kind of start thinking about co-creating and open tables, co-creating open tables for to bring in students, librarian, any stakeholder that might be affected by, by the policy. Um, so um, you can bring sort of like an exercise to get to start like redeveloping or, or developing or updating an existing policy. So if you want to move a bit further. So basically, we, we like shamelessly, we, we have written some stuff, <laughs> quite a lot, uh, but mostly we tend to write in a kind of guidish style. So um, if you go back, um, it's not just like theory around it, but also some practical guidance on how to do things or how to co-create. So we give you here like, come back, <laughs> you're, you're too fast. You're too fast. So <laughs> one, one further down. Uh, it's like 12. So then we have like a timeline. So it's to help you to sit about how you want to do it in, for example, from the next year, how you want to kind of update your your policy or create a new one. Uh, next one, please. Then we have like a little roadmap for you to think about which kind of how to map your strategic priorities. So if you want to map your policy landscape, maybe you have an open science, then you have open data, then you have an open access, and then you have an OER policy. And maybe you, you, you're in, in a digital strategy, maybe you like to bring them together. Um, this is something that you can see like the open, open policies is quite slightly fragmented around um, like higher education institutions, so and different units are responsible for such policies. So you have like open access and open science tend to sit in the library, but digital and open education tend to sit like in the educational lab domain. So maybe it's kind of time to bring all the policies together and create sort of like an open knowledge one. This this is an idea, and actually I know a university in Spain that is kind of experimenting with that. Uh, maybe next one, Leo. Um, I love the snakes and ladders. <laughs> <Comments>. <laughs> uh, the snakes and ladders, yes. <laughs> and uh, of course, this is a good exercise for people that is quite new into policy making, just to also the analysis of your policies and the policies, uh, policy landscapes, um, and different open policies around and educational policies to so see. Where are the weakness and the threats and the strength of your policies to kind of start thinking how to redesign the policy world around you? <laughs> no comment. Yeah, no comment. Uh, <laughs> and next one, Leo. And of course, uh, I can download from Zenodo or you can have it here as a kit. So if you want to start working with students and stuff, uh, oh, I don't know why I got, let me fix the last slide because there are customer segments and it should be there. That's my bad. Uh, I didn't copy the whole policy in there, so I'll fix it and, and then we'll share it with you in, in Zenodo and we'll put the link on, on Twitter. So if anyone wants to use the kit, it's, it's an open educational resource at the end of the day. Um, any questions? That's us. We look pretty in small pictures. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there's no more questions, then I would like to ask you all to give our wonderful presenters a big round of applause. It's been an absolutely fantastic session, really exciting for us here to get us into the mood for this year, this week's conference. And the session recording video from the session will be up on the website later today or early tomorrow, um, ready for sharing more widely. So from all of us here at OER by Domains 21, thank you very much. <laughs>